So where I grew up, we were taught to count seconds, one Mississippi, two Mississippi. Now, I can't speak to, in Canada, what do they do? Oh, you do that, okay. <laughs> so what I want to do uh, this morning is teach you another way to count, which is the rate at which stars explode in the universe, which is one supernova, two supernova. Here we go. <laughs> one supernova, two supernova. So that's what's happening in the universe. Roughly every second, there is a star that explodes. In our galaxy, it happens only once every 100 years. You can do the math as to how many galaxies that means there are out there. It's about a billion. And as a theoretical physicist, uh, of course, I'm severely disappointed that the observers are not finding all of them. <laughs> However, uh, they are improving. And what I'm going to talk about today is a little bit of what's been happening in the observational world of finding these stars. But also, I'm going to speak about what these are. I'm going to focus on stars that are more massive than the sun, things that are roughly 10, 10 times the mass of the sun or larger, because those are the ones that really make a lot of the elements uh, that are presently composed of your body or, or were even in the coffee that by now the caffeine should have sunk in. So keep that in mind. So we want to find one per second. So. I started uh, my career studying neutron stars, very dense objects that Vicky's going to talk about. Uh, but because of my involvement with CIFAR, I got very distracted. Uh, and that distraction started with one of the first surveys that really started to have impact on the field as the community grew in its ability to detect distant supernovae. And that was the uh, project called the Supernova Legacy Survey that was carried out uh, at the Canada-France-Hawaii telescope. Uh, this survey really did find many supernovae, of course not one per second. However, it did start the field in a different mode of being able to survey large parts of the sky and find supernovae, shall we say, at will, at a rate that allowed for the observers to study them in detail. And so this was the survey that, as I became exposed to it, realized that not only are they finding many of them, but for theorists like myself, I'm much more interested in the odd supernovae, those that are, are new for us, the rare events. I'm not going to talk about the rare events, uh, though many of those rare events we think are tied to things that make these compact objects called magnetars. Uh, but I think in, in a brief talk, that's probably a little bit too much to hope for. So of course, the way you find supernovae is you look for an arrow in the sky. <laughs> <coughs> And the arrow always points to where the event is. Uh, so it's quite easy. I mean, I really should become an observer. <laughs> it's much, much easier. So here's an example of an arrow in the sky. Uh, so this is a Hubble image. Don't ask me which galaxy it is. It doesn't matter. Uh, but this is a galaxy much like the Milky Way, as you can tell. Of course, the, uh, so it's a spiral galaxy. Here's where a pre-image where there was no supernovae. And then, of course, when the supernovae was discovered, uh, it's here. What's a little difficult to tell in this image is actually how bright that supernovae is compared to the whole galaxy. I'll just tell you that that typical supernovae can get as bright as about 10% of all the light in the galaxy. So of course, to find them in nearby galaxies, they don't need to be that bright. Uh, they just need to be at the arrow tip. Um, <laughs> But in distant galaxies, where as the galaxy gets further and further away, it's occupying a smaller fraction of the sky and becoming more like a small blob, to detect these, it's, it's even harder. And so let me just show you another example. Uh, again, follow the arrow. Uh, so this is a supernovae that was found in, in 2013. Supernovae are named by the year they're found. And then as, as in much of astronomy, we have very arcane ways of naming them. The first one we call Big A. So 2013, Big A, and then Big B. What do you think we do next, C? <laughs> what do you do when you get to Z? Yeah, I forget what they do, but they change it all the time. Uh, there's a famous uh, variable star naming scenario, which is even worse than that. But this is, this is the astronomer's attempt to keep theorists out. Uh, because there's no way I can track what it is. But the excitement here is that you can see this is a, a Sloan Digital Sky image 
of a galaxy that was uh, prior to the event that was just sitting, shall we say, in the archive. Um, and then, of course, what was found by looking from one night to the other was a very bright object. And you can see in this case, it's a little more evident, I think, that it's approaching the brightness if you add up all this brightness of all uh, this whole galaxy. So you find supernovae now by just looking at large patches of the sky and, the, and subtracting the image from tonight from the image from when you last observed. And this what we call difference imaging was really th the ability to do that en masse was both because of uh, CCDs, which are becoming less expensive because all of you have them in your iPhones, and the ability to do the computing, which allows for the observers to actually do the image subtraction real time. You'd like to find these events as soon as possible so that you can follow them up with a much larger telescope and get much more detailed information. So that's the field. It is, I mean, it's a pun, but the field is exploding. <laughs> and what I want to talk about is what are we observing? What are these stars? So I want to slow down a little bit now and give you a very brief course in stellar structure and evolution. Uh, when I teach it at Santa Barbara, it's referred to as stars with Lars. <laughs> uh, you're going to get the two minute version. So the sun is hot at the center. This is not the sun, but let me do the sun. Let's start with the easy case. The sun is hot at the center because it needs to be to hold itself up against gravity. So that's what sets the temperature at the center of the sun. It's about 10 million Kelvin in the units we like to use as physicists. It's, set, it's hot at the center. It's cold at the edge. So all of you know what happens, especially because you live in Canada. You think you're heating your home. Of course, you're not. You're really heating the exterior, right? You're setting up a temperature gradient, so it's hot inside and cold outside, and heat is leaving your house the higher you set the temperature. So you're not heating your home. Stars are much the same. They're hot at the center and cold at the surface, and so heat is leaving. And the question then is, what's the source of that energy as it leaves? Well, the source of that energy for most stars, for all stars, uh, alternates between gravity, the slight, 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 very slight infall upon itself, um, until it gets hot enough that fusion reactions can start, and those fusion reactions become the energy source for a long period of time. So the sun is presently burning hydrogen to helium. That's about halfway done. So you've got about 5 billion years before anything like uh, what you may have been concerned about it won't become a black hole. And these fusion reactions just proceed in massive stars. If I now show you something like a 10, 10 or a 15, a star that's 15 times the mass of the sun, these proceed all the way up to make elements that are heavier and heavier and heavier until you get to the most heavy element that gives you energy from fusion, um, and that's iron. And so in this case, the way the star looks at the end of its life is a, a ball of iron, which is about a little bit more than the mass of the sun, and then shells, silicon, oxygen, carbon, helium, and material at the outside edge, which actually has not gone, undergone any fusion. It's just sitting there providing uh, pressure. So what happens to these stars is when you get this much mass, uh, there's no more fusion, it collapses. And this collapse and explosion leads to the creation of all these elements. All of these elements are sent out far, far away um, and become you. So here's carbon, uh, an element you probably like. Oxygen, you're presently breathing. Uh, nitrogen's not on here. And of course, most of the helium. So the Big Bang makes very little. Big Bang just makes hydrogen, helium, trace of lithium. All the other elements in the periodic table which I've just flashed up for you here, are, are made in either uh, this large stars from this website. These are basically the core collapse supernovae. So you can see carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, everything basically up to iron. And then I'm not going to talk about because there's, there's, well, in the amount of time I have, you don't want me to explain the origin of every element in the periodic table. <laughs> but the point is, that's where they're being made are in these stars that explode. So if I go back and I just give you a sense for what's happening, this iron ball collapses at the center. That happens in a time scale of about one second. The collapse is communicated to the outside of the star from a bounce that sends a shock wave through the star. That shock wave takes about a day to get to the surface. So if you're at the surface of the star, the first thing you would feel physically is a shock wave that goes through you sends you out at about 10 to 20,000 kilometers per second moving outwards. 
that expanding envelope of this whole material is what provides the bright event we see. As that gas of radiation and material expands out, uh, we see it, and we'll see it for typically 30 days to maybe even 100 days quite often. If you wait now 1,000 years, all of that ejecta, what we call the ejecta, all of that material that was in the star uh, is now sent out. This is the Crab Nebula. It's sent out far, far away. This is, typically, this is roughly 10 light years for what I'm going to do today. There's an object left at the center, which is what we call a neutron star. That's that iron ball that collapsed. In the case of this one, it's spinning at 33 milliseconds and a magnetic field in units that you probably don't use. 10 to the 12 Gauss, it really doesn't have much meaning. It's a very high magnetic field. And this nebular material is all of that stuff that was made in the star. It's going back out into the interstellar medium to be recycled to make new stars, new planets. Now, the last thing I want to briefly talk about before I talk about an upcoming survey um, is that these supernovae not only spew material out into their local gas, but they also add up over time to expel gas from galaxies themselves. So this is actually an image of a galaxy showing material that's leaving, most likely being driven by the accumulation of a lot of energy from all these explosions. So not only are supernovae important for understanding how elements are made, they're also very important for understanding galaxies and how galaxies evolve with time. So just to wrap up, uh, I want to talk briefly about a facility that's coming online right now. Again, my friends, the observers, keep trying. They want to get one a second. Uh, they're not there yet, uh, but this is a facility that's coming online at Palomar. This is Mount Palomar in California. It's the Fable 200-inch. The 48-inch telescope over here is the one that did the Palomar plates, which were physically this big, which were the patrol plates for the sky. Um, and what's happening uh, right now is an upgrade of the camera. And there's another fun Canadian coincidence here which is the first survey that was done here, the Palomar Transient Factory, used an original camera from, the CFH, from CFHT that was, as they say, sitting on the shelf. Uh, so we got a, a good sale. Uh, that only was able to cover this much of the area of the camera. And now with the new facility, uh, and of course more money, there's now a camera that is filling the whole plane. And this is what it looks like. It exists. It's actually on the telescope. Uh, it has 600 megapixels, which I know doesn't sound like very much anymore. I don't know what's in your camera these days, but these are really expensive pixels. <laughs> you have the cheap pixels. Uh, and this survey uh, is going to be able basically to do the whole sky every night if one chooses to, or search for objects that change rapidly. You can look even in the same night. So, uh, just with that large piece of hardware in front of you, I'm going to stop. Thank you very much. <laughs>